Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Keeping the World Company. It's trying to understand the world as the world evolves around us, sometimes up, but these days mostly down. And the question before the House is how much, like a proxy vote, <laughs> is a proxy war? Um, the meaning of the word proxy is instrumental. And why do we have so many of them? And I don't mean proxy votes. I mean proxy wars. And for this discussion, we have co-host Tim Apicella, and we have scholar and researcher, retired UCLA historian, Gene Rosenfeld. Good morning, Tim. Good morning, Gene. Good morning. Good morning. So let me start with you. Uh, and, and this is the title question, Gene. Uh, how much like a proxy vote is a proxy war? Um, well, if you mean in terms of results, a proxy vote counts as much as any other vote. So a proxy war counts as much as any other war. The difference is that someone stands in instrumentally for another party. In this case, let's look at the proxy wars we're in right now, Ukraine and Gaza, where we have Russia quite visibly on one side, but we have proxies on the other side. If you uh, subscribe to the theory that I do, that this is really a war of Russia against the West, and these are wars that are intended to uh, fatigue and attrit the capabilities of the United States to defend its leadership role in the world. Yeah, but let me, let me go to one point. Um... In the Donbass uh, and other parts of eastern Ukraine, um, the Russians were using and are using Ukrainians who speak Russian um, to fight the Ukrainians. Isn't that a proxy? It's a, it's a partial proxy, isn't it? Yes, but again, it does not make Russia invisible. Uh, I would say the United States is a bit invisible right now. Uh, not and to our own detriment, uh, we are basically hurting ourselves by not supporting Ukraine at the moment. And we have an incipient civil war going on in the uh, legitimate structure, political structure of the United States, where a charismatic movement of considerable proportion proportions is attempting to take over the um, offices of a political party. The GOP has become the POT, the party of Trump. Yeah, well, some people say the party of Putin. Um, you know, but let me go to one, one thing you mentioned, that it's about, it's about tr transparency, it's about visibility, okay? So you have, uh, you have wars that are proxy wars, where the proxy relationship is visible. And uh, as you mentioned, you have wars that are proxy wars, uh, where the, you know, the, the relationship is secret, that you don't see it. Uh, which is more effective? Uh, which should we worry about most? Uh, which, is, which is the one that is happening, uh, you know, in Ukraine, and for that matter, uh, there are secret things happening with the U.S. as proxy. There are secret things happening, certainly in the Middle East. This is all about secrecy. Uh, what is that a kind of uh, asymmetrical hybrid weapon of proxy wars? There's an interesting situation in the Middle East uh, because uh, Russia is not visible right now to most people of the globe in the Middle East, and yet Iran and Russia are helping one another in their building of their own armaments, and Iran is supplying drones to um, the so-called axis of resistance, uh, the asymmetrical movements like Hamas uh, and Palestinian Islamic Jihad and Hezbollah in the Middle East, and Hezbollah is attacking the United States, and the United States is attacking as Hezbollah, and Israel is attacking Hezbollah. So all of these different 
things that are going on in the Middle East are confusing. Why are the Houthis attacking uh, commercial vessels? Why is the United States Navy bombing or sending uh, missiles or drones to Yemen? Uh, and why are um, uh, proxies, proxy movements in Iraq attacking American soldiers and killing them? It's very confusing unless you pan the camera back and you see that this is a war of attrition, again, against the capabilities of the United States to maintain its leadership role in the world. As much pressure as the, so, as the um, Russians can put on the United States, it is putting on the United States via Iran and the axis of resistance in the Middle East. In Ukraine, it's different because Ukraine is, according to Putin, a part of Russia and it's non-negotiable, and there are nuclear consequences, certain individuals like Medvedev say, if, uh, if Russia is forced to go back to its previous borders to 1991. Now, I don't know what they are saying about Ukraine, what they would accept or not accept, whether they would take a bite of Ukraine or all of Ukraine. But I don't think they have the capability to take all of Ukraine unless we totally fold our support. So proxy wars are very different. The visibility of both parties differs in both cases. But I think we have to look at Gaza and include it also as a war against the West. Yeah, you know, I was thinking while you were talking about that, I mean, so the, a proxy can be an element in a, in a, uh, a direct war. It can be one element, and part of that um, hybrid notion, the uh, asymmetrical notion. And when you think of uh, using um, people as uh, human shields, hiding under hospitals, um, and the, the Israelis say, "Look, come out and fight. Let me see you. I want to see you. I want to see the you know the the fighters that are against us." Uh, they don't. They hide, and they use people. Um, and they use them as, what do you want to call it, propaganda proxies. So in many ways, you know, the fight, in my view, the fight in, in uh, Gaza is, is also proxy. It's more of an individual kind of proxy, but it's nevertheless proxy. Tim, let me turn to you. You know, it seems to me that we have a dynamic going on. Um, you, you could argue that in every war that you can think of, there are proxies maybe smaller or larger, and some are pure proxies. But do you agree that proxy wars have been going on a long time, uh, and people hiding behind the skirts of someone else, um, people using, um, you know, uh, lesser nations, nation, lesser, you know, national actors as proxies for their own, their own designs? Do you agree this has been going on a long time, and can you tell us why you feel that way? I uh, absolutely agree that they've been going on a long time. Uh, let's look at the 1953 uh, behind-the-scenes proxy war that our CIA uh, government um, basically pushed out uh, Mossadegh, who was a Democratic elected leader in Iran, and um, the Shah of Iran was installed uh, thanks to Eisenhower and Churchill because um, Mossadegh basically put a an oil, or he nationalized the oil companies in Iran. And of course, you can't do that to the United States because we don't like our oil being shut down or shut off. Uh, so there was a behind the scenes uh, proxy um, battle, if you will, that has now um, had it reared his ugly head and, and uh, four decades later, we're still dealing with that uh, in, a, in a way that we hadn't imagined. Uh, you might want to call that unintended consequences, but be as it may, that's what it is. We can go to 1973 when the United States um, was behind the um, ouster and assassination of um, Sal Salvador Allende as the leader. And uh, who was installed? Uh, Pinochet, who uh, committed all sorts of atrocities against his own people. Uh, look at the classic one of pushing the Soviets out of Afghanistan. Um, no, no boots uh, were, were put on the ground, but we sure taught the Mujahideen how to use uh, shoulder-based um, Stinger missiles, and um, that was quite successful in, in roosting out uh, the Soviets out of the country. So we have a whole, you know, 
cornucopia of, of history of quiet proxy wars versus overt, um, obvious proxy wars. I, I look at um, Ukraine, uh, no boots have entered the ground or, or touched the ground in Ukraine, but we've sent in $113.4 billion of, of military aid and, and dollars to basically participate in a proxy war. So I'm a little more overt with Ukraine and certainly uh, covert when it came to uh, our, our dealings in Iran back in the uh, 1950s. You know, Gene, one of my favorite guys on YouTube is a fellow named Simon Whistler. I don't know if you've ever caught his commentaries, but it's very interesting. He's English, and uh, he talks very fast. You have to really listen. One of the things he said in a, in a commentary that I saw was that proxy wars avoid direct confrontation, and therefore the level of violence, the level of war, is arguably less when you have a proxy war among weaker parties instead of a direct confrontation, which would likely be nuclear, which could be nuclear uh, among the, the larger parties. Uh, do you agree? Um, do you feel there's a benefit in proxy wars? Well, I think there's something going on that we haven't really made clear to ourselves and the rest of the world. And that is that we are now involved in a war in which it's being fought by means um, globally that have never been seen before. The Cold War was a time, as Tim has pointed out, of a lot of the use of a lot of proxies, uh, the most dramatic of which, of course, uh, was to some extent Vietnam, where you had an ostensible civil war and we did have boots on the ground. <laughs> we took sides. Nevertheless, we did not directly confront either China or Russia in that war. We fought it to supposedly stop the spread of the dominoes in Southeast Asia. And history has not come to the conclusion yet whether that actually succeeded or not. Um, but in terms of what's going on now, uh, Vladimir Putin is a former uh, KGB FSB agent. He is employing psychological operations, psyops, in this war with the use of the internet in our elections and the use of false narratives and his speeches, his most recent interview with Tucker Carlson, rewriting the history of, this, of, of, of Russia and Ukraine. He is employing proxies such as Iran and, uh, and, and uh, he's He's, uh, and, and the so-called axis of resistance, everything from asymmetrical movements to states. Um, he is neutralizing China's influence in the world by, in essence, putting China in an agreeable position where it is not um, active uh, in what Russia is doing, but it's not preventing what Russia is doing. So... And he is using threats of uh, space war and cyber war and nuclear war through the mouths of his allies and uh, associates like Dmitry Medvedev just recently uh, in terms of threatening the United States not to take one more step, not to um, pass uh, one more bill uh, of funding or terrible things will happen. All of these means are what you see in elements of agencies like the FSB, KGB, in terms of controlling the narrative, controlling the perceptions, and controlling the responses of the people that you are arrayed against. So we are involved in a world war now with Russia that is trying to avoid the catastrophes on the ground that we're seeing, for example, in Ukraine. Yes, it's less violent in that we don't have a global third world war like we did in World War II. But in terms of the outcomes, it's just as potentially devastating. Now, some say that uh, Russia, you know, and this happened, uh, you know, uh, when, it, when the USSR came apart, um, can't do this on a sustainable basis. It doesn't have the money. It doesn't have the resources. Uh, its uh, economy is 120th of what the U.S. is. 
Uh, and, you know, ultimately with the sanctions, I'm not sure how effective the sanctions are. Some people don't think they're effective at all. Or that Putin has found a way around every single one of them. Um, but um, they, they're, they're, not, they're not economically strong. How long can they continue this multi-facade, this, this multi-asymmetrical uh, war? It costs a lot of money to be out there in so many places. We haven't even begun to examine uh, how far the Russian tentacles are going right now, and those are the ones we could read about. There have to be secret ones, many, many more secret ones. How long can they sustain that? Well, J.D. Vance just went to Munich, where there was an essential meeting uh, of Western leaders to deliver the message that the reason why the Republicans could not fund Ukraine at this time is that um, it would um, deplete our own defense in terms of supplies such as artillery shells. Now, this is patently ridiculous because we can produce very quickly what we need and replace it. We have both the money and the manpower to do that, just as we did in World War II. But he's spreading the word that the United States doesn't have the capability of doing this, which plays right into Russian propaganda now. Putin is up for election. It's a fake election, but as far as the world is concerned, he wants the, the globe to believe that he really has the support, the backing, the strength, and the capacity that he needs to prevail in Ukraine and beyond. As to whether that's a paper tiger, I think to some extent it greatly is. I think the stronger methods and more extreme methods that Putin takes and the greater the threats that are voiced, it speaks to weakness. And I would also refer people to Timothy Snyder's current essay um, on the internet on weak men, including Putin and the GOP. That was incredible. I saw that. That was incredible. That was one of his best pieces ever, trying to tie all this together. But you know, one thing about um, Putin and propaganda, he was active in electing uh, Trump uh, in um, uh, 2016. He uh, tried in 2020, probably used the same um, you know, the same playbook. Um, and now this thing about Smirnov, uh, Smirnov is very scary because they planted it. They planted him and the Trump Johnson, uh, Maquette, what's his name? Uh, the, the, uh, the previous, uh, uh house, uh, speaker, um, all perpetuated the lie. And that was so for a year or more. In fact, uh, they built a, a phony baloney impeachment on the basis of this lie that came through Smirnov, and it came from Russia. So the, 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 ma the master puppeteer was at work here um, and uh, playing serious games with public opinion, public policy. Uh, and Fox News repeated that lie virtually thousands of times in hundreds of episodes, um, and arguably they knew it was phony, but they kept on repeating it. So, the, you know, take all that together and what you have is a propaganda um, a propaganda war uh, in the United States to break public opinion and to undermine public governmental resolve. Isn't that part of a proxy war? It's kind of like mm, the reverse proxy, undermine your adversary using proxies using agents <laughs> fair I mean, enough Trump is an agent let's that they exist they they're usually under the radar this has become very public he's been arrested he's confessed and it's now being reported as to who will believe it the more insidious type of propaganda war is when the people you know in your family among your friends among your associates convert to believing conspiracy theories uh, propagated by people like Robert F. Kennedy III, Robert, um, yeah, Robert F. Kennedy III, not Fitzgerald, Robert Kennedy III, who, who really uh, is kind of a, a, a mentally fragile individual, <laughs> but he gets a lot of press because of his name 
and he floats these conspiracy theories that then in fact were fairly intelligent people and rational people who don't want to believe what they read in the newspapers. Suddenly they don't trust our mainstream institutions. Part of asymmetric warfare against another state is to reduce confidence and trust in the institutions that maintain stability, social and political stability. Trump has been a master at this since 2016. And we need to, to understand that every time we vote, it's a vote against our institutions or for our institutions. Mm, yeah. Uh, shifting a little bit, Tim, you know, we've seen, uh, even if we didn't know before, even if we didn't know a year ago, uh, the power of drones, the power of technology, uh, the power of satellite navigation, uh, as with Starlink. Uh, we, we didn't know just how important those things are, and they seem to be very important uh, in the proxy wars that we're following in both Ukraine and the Middle East. So my question to you is, you know, if we have an increase in these mm, proxy wars or skirmishes, what have you, uh, isn't that directly connected to advances in weapons technology? Well, we, we discussed this about a half year ago, um, where kinetic warfare is um, not the warfare that we should always be thinking about. Non-kinetic warfare being cyber warfare, and certainly the, the advancement of drone technology is shaping the battlefield in quite a, quite a different way. Um, we had a U.S. ship that was almost uh, hit because uh, a drone from the Houthis got through um, a web of, of, of defenses, and it was left to one machine gun on that ship that actually took it out as the last, uh, the last, um, the last means of, of destruction for, for that drone. So uh, classic things like battleships and aircraft carriers may be rendered obsolete in 20 years from now uh, because they're susceptible to swarm drones or, um, you know, drones that could travel under the water then suddenly surface. Uh, who knows what technology is going to lead and with every technology, be it from World War I to World War II or, or prior to World War I, like uh, the machine gun was a technology that completely changed the battlefield. And uh, that you know, caused the soldiers to look at uh, trench warfare. So yes, um, drone warfare will definitely reshape how we conduct kinetic warfare, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's really uh, a little bit chilling to think that the Houthis can um, have a weapon that they got from their principal Iran, and they can use that weapon to sink a ship. I mean, a military ship, even a, an aircraft carrier. Um, that's, that's the nature of these weapons now. And so how do we deal with an uh, insurrection group, a proxy group uh, like the Houthis and others, uh, you know, Hezbollah, for that matter, Hamas, Hamas uh, how do we deal with them now, given these weapons, given the pipeline of weapons from the proxy principles? Um, do we have that in hand yet, or is that a work in progress? Oh, it's, we've lost our capability for intel in a variety of countries um, that's been uh, slowly dismantled over the decades. Uh, so our intel is, is, is sorely lacking and that needs to be ramped up uh, so we know what's going on. And then of course, then you have the traditional strike them where it hurts, you know, hit those factories that are producing these drones. And um, again, that will take, that will take intel, but it's, it's, it's critical that you proactively dismantle them before they're, uh, the drones are up and flying. That's not easy. No. It, it, it depends on intelligence, does it? You know, you're Correct. talking, Gene, about uh, propaganda. And well, the, you know, the flip side of propaganda is intelligence. And it strikes me that with some of these um, proxy agents, it's more difficult. It's uh, maybe it's the relationship, maybe secret, um, the development of weapons, the, the pipeline of weapons against the, 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 the proxy target. Um, you know, maybe more sophisticated um, and dangerous uh, to have on the ground intelligence. And so we have to rely on satellite photography and all those things, which may, may not be as good as our intelligence in years past. Uh, where does intelligence fit in setting up, um, setting up a, a proxy and in dealing with a proxy? 
Well, first a footnote on what Tim just said. I just finished a book called War Against the Wind, which is about the kamikaze campaign developed by Japan in World War II, which if you look at it is uh, basically drone warfare. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. sort of drone warfare because you, you may have a human element that element is expendable like a machine and you've devised both underwater and above ground air capabilities to take out ships. And they took out 90 ships at Okinawa, for example. Said so even though the Japanese Navy had been decimated, they had developed this new campaign and it was it really was uh, in essence the front row seat on what we're going through now in World War III. With regard to intelligence, we have SIGINT and we have human. We have signals intelligence, um, Primarily, we have the same leverage on intelligence that we used to have. Right. And, and we have human intelligence. Now, in the Middle East, uh, we have we have possibilities for human intelligence because the Israeli population comes from all over the Middle East. It has capabilities in terms of becoming um, agents and, and conveying human intelligence. And I think this is why we have such good intelligence on Iran. In terms of signals intelligence, we just had a break in that recently uh, when a congressman exposed the fact that Russia is developing potentially a weapon that any day now, the administration just admitted yesterday, can go into space and disrupt communication satellites from all countries, not just the United States, by using nuclear capability in space. So this is another dangerous way, along with hypersonic missiles, that Russia is developing to avoid an all-out nuclear third world war and utilizing nuclear and new capabilities, such as drones, to greatly damage and defeat its enemy, the West. Yeah, it sounds like disruption, uh, creating chaos, uh, undermining a given civil society and economy uh, is what the target would be. If you take out the satellites, you take out a lot of communication. Uh, if you disrupt public opinion and misinform people, you're, you're breaking down the society. You're creating a, a civil war, a civil disturbance in that society and making them less likely, less able uh, to deal with you. And so um, that takes me to a, a, a point of view about the new Cold War. It sounds to me like we're on two levels with the new Cold War. Let me put this to you, Tim. You know, in the, in the Cold War, it was, um, it, it was cold. That was good. And, you know, we didn't actually blow the world up. Um, but you knew who the players were. You knew it was Russia versus the United States. Um, now in the new, the new paradigm, whatever you want to call this war, Cold War number two, maybe, um, you, have, you have a visible Cold War where Russia is attacking the U.S. and, you know, the U.S. is trying to defend itself from all of these disruptive efforts. But part of Russia's disruptive efforts are proxy wars. So actually what you have is a hybrid. It's a combination. That's your term, Gene. It's, it's a combination of the Cold War, where the parties are identified, dealing confrontation directly, um, plus all these third party, all these third party proxy wars, also dedicated to trying to disrupt things. You know, the Red Sea and satellites in space, it's kind of the same thing. Let's see if we can disrupt the world. Uh, and if we disrupt the world, that helps us. So my, my point, though, is that we have a new paradigm going on. It's the big players against each other visibly. It's, um, it's the proxy wars and the secret wars. Huh? There's another one. Uh, it's actually three levels. Is this, Tim, is this the way it's going to be? Are we evolving into this as a, as a, as a paradigm that will last you know, for decades and decades, maybe maybe through the 21st century or until we blow ourselves up. Um, is, is this the way it's going? Is this, is this an, an irreversible process? Well, the fact that mankind uh, has had wars since the dawn of mankind, uh, the answer is yes, this will continue in a different form. Uh, you know, it's 
Cold War was, you're right, was primarily between the United States and Russia, but now we have other visible players. We have North Korea, we have Iran, we have China. Uh, but the playing field of warfare is, like I said in the previous answer, is that's changing. Uh, cyber warfare is, is far more significant and prevalent than um, our ability to uh, commit kinetic warfare. So will this continue? Absolutely. Um, as technology advances, so do the methodologies of warfare. And, um, you know, should we be concerned that Russia could put a nuke in, in outer space, uh, whether its intended target is on terra firma Earth or not? Um, you know, China blew up one of their satellites as a test uh, about two years ago. <clears throat> um, if we want to explore <laughs> the heavens, uh, we got to stop creating a lot of litter uh, between Earth and the heavens. And um, so for everything, there's, a, you know, there's, there's collateral damage for everything we do. And I think um, our, new, our new proxy wars will have unintended consequences that we can't quite predict, but will occur and we'll be dealing with it. For example, I'll, I'll talk about that regime change in Iran back in 1953. I don't think anyone uh, anticipated the outcome and the the prolonged um, animosity between the United States and Iran as a result of that regime change. Mm. You know, I want to go to uh, what uh, Tim was saying a minute ago, and that is um, assassination practice, regime change practice. It seems to me, following on your thread, Gene, um, that this is part of the asymmetric war. It's part of the hybrid. Um, that if you want to undermine the other guy, you can go directly, you know, to 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 his leadership, uh, its leadership. In fact, you can go to your adversaries, uh, like Navalny, uh, or that that pilot in Spain who was murdered only a few days ago, or Kim Jong Un, uh, how he murdered his uh, his relative who threatened him in some way uh, in Asia with some uh, exotic poison. And of course, Putin, you know, he does that regularly. Uh, so, you know, my question is, part of this asymmetric, multi-layered process has to also include assassination of leaders. And it has to include, you know, efforts to do regime change, uh, which I think we are seeing. We are seeing that. We are seeing assassinations and we are seeing efforts to do regime change. That's got to be part of this whole multi-layered, multi-proxy, you know, paradigm going forward. Don't you agree? Assassination was basically invented as a, t as a tool instrument of war um, in the first uh, modern terrorist movement of the anarchists in Russia. Mm -hmm. They are employing it, this regime in Russia is employing it against its opposition. It's a kind of an admission of weakness. They're employing an asymmetric method by a weak, presumably sub-state group, but it's the state that's employing it because the state is controlled by a small group of people. That's what Navalny uh, exposed. You can go to his video on the internet and he basically brilliantly exposed the corrupt uh, mafia type movement that, that took over Russia in, after the Soviet Union fell. This is a very uh, fragile regime. It's only been in place for about 30 years. Its leader is aging and hasn't that many years left. And there is no program for succession. We have been a republic for over 200 years. We have a strong way of replacing leadership every four years, which is amazing in the history of the political world. Russia has absolutely no experience in that. This Russian regime is looking, trying to look strong because it is so very, very weak. Killing Prigozhin on the right, killing Navalny in terms of democ a, a democratic. Uh, Russia, um, assassinating the pilot. My God, this is a guy who, who basically was nobody in the Russian uh, military, except he 
brought a helicopter with a bunch of papers over to Ukraine. This gives you an idea of how scared they are. So I think that what we need to do here in the United States, our leaders need to be firm, strong, and have a lot of stamina and insight into the psychology of what's going on. Russia is potentially, in Medvedev's words, potentially uh, facing a very chaotic future again. And they've had so much suffering relative to their revolutions and their invasions. The Russian people don't want this by the same token. Russian people who are educated and have some stake in the future don't want this regime to prevail either. One last point, Tim, I'd like to just mention <clears throat> that we have traditionally considered uh, proxy wars as wars by, by states, subordinate states, proxy states. But what we find now uh, is that the proxies are not states. Um, they're terrorist groups. Uh, that's different. And they're, you know, they're given weapons and money and training and direction and all that support, but they're not states. And, and what I find very interesting is that you, you ask the ICJ, International Court of Justice, why they're going after Israel on genocide, but they're not going after Hamas on genocide, and the answer is, well, it's not in the agreement. We only go after states, <clears throat> which I, I find are indefensible. Um, in any event, uh, this is a new part of the new paradigm, that you as the, you know, the principal proxy person, proxy state, can find a terror organization to do your bidding as your proxy. That's different. It's more nimble. It's more flexible. And, um, you know, you, if, if, if somebody destroys them, they can pop up again. It makes it harder to deal with the proxies, doesn't it? And more likely that it encourages terrorism, doesn't it? It's effective. If you don't have a formal uniformed army, uh, you have an informal, you know, civilian, um, hidden civilian base like Hamas, um, it's, it's, it's affordable and it's very effective. You know, the United States is involved with uh, a, 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 a tons of uh, <laughs> proxy wars trying to stamp out terrorism. Uh, Syria, Cameroon, Iraq, Egypt, Somalia, Kenya, uh, Lebanon, Libya, Mali, Niger, all these countries, we are involved with proxy, proxy efforts and, and money um, because we're dealing with just that, a non-state terrorism group. So um, I suspect because terrorism is effective and cost-effective, and I suspect you'll see more of that in the future. Yeah, and the UN less able to deal with it on, for many reasons. Okay, we're, we're at the time when we ask you to uh, uh, assimilate everything we've said, and uh, this is like AI, you know? Give us a little summary of everything we've said and tell us what message you want to leave with us about all these issues. Dean, you go first. The message I would like to leave is that our leadership at, in, a, in a year where we have political campaigns and we need to speak out and explain in understandable terms to our population what is at stake we need to understand the role of Russia and its intentions in the world today. This particular regime does not represent the Russia of the past, but it would definitely like to represent not only the Russia of the future, but the world of the future. And if you read Putin's speeches and you understand what he is saying, you know that the whole thrust of what we're experiencing now is to discourage the United States population, to confuse us, to polarize us, to trick us into seeing a reality that does not exist because it's created in terms of conspiracy theories by a small 
and growing movement headed up by a pathological personality who happens to be running for president. And it's beyond the United States. The, the stakes are very great. Putin is an aging leader. His regime is held together by um, greed and ambition and power. It's likely not to outlast him. It's likely to be um, become more repressive as it becomes weaker. And the um, refusal and the co-opting co of uh, the Freedom Caucus in the Congress is, um, in essence, uh, a, a proxy for Russia in its opportunity to replace U.S. leadership in the United States. So when you look at people uh, who are refusing to pass the bill to fund Ukraine, you're looking straight into the eyes of the Russian establishment. We become proxies for them. Tim, your final thoughts? Final thoughts is you and I did a show in 2015 uh, dedicated to the nature of propaganda and how Donald Trump uh, utilizes propaganda. And back then in 2015, what we both agreed on was that, A, the government or some entity uh, needs to educate the, the Americans on what propaganda looks like, how to identify it, two, um, how it works, how it's effective, and last but not least, how to counter it, how to reject it or at least acknowledge it and then decide whether you want to reject it or not. Amen. From your lips, both of you, to God's ears, thank you very much. Tim Apicella, uh, Gene Rosenfeld, thank you very much. Aloha.